6 p.m. I have prepared everything, the sharp knives, the pointed steak, fresh garlic, and the wild dog roses. All these I have taken and concealed in the vestry, where we can get at them when our solemn vigil commences. If either or both of us die with our fearful task undone, let those reading my record see that this is done. I lay it upon them as a solemn obligation. That the vampire be pierced through the heart with the stake. Then let the burial service be read over the poor clay at last released from its doom. Thus shall the vampire cease to be, and the lost soul rest. July 12th. All is over. After the most terrible night of watching and horror, one vampire at least will trouble the world no more. But how thankful should we be to a merciful providence that that awful tomb was not disturbed by anyone not having the knowledge necessary to deal with its dreadful occupant. I write this with no feelings of self-complacency, but simply with a great gratitude for the years of study I have been able to devote to this special subject. And now to my tale. Just before sunset last night, the rector and I locked ourselves into the church and took up our position in the pulpit. It was one of those pulpits to be found in some churches, which has entered from the vestry, the preacher appearing at a good height through an arched opening in the wall. This gave us a sense of security, which we felt we needed, a good view of the interior, and direct access to the implements which I had concealed in the vestry. The sun set, and the twilight gradually deepened and faded. There was, so far, no sign of the usual fog, nor any howling of the dogs. At nine o'clock the moon rose, and her pale light gradually flooded the aisles, and still no sign of any kind from the Sarah tomb. The rector had asked me several times what he might expect, but I was determined that no words or thought of mine should influence him, and that he should be convinced by his own senses alone. By half-past ten we were both getting very tired, and I began to think that perhaps after all we should see nothing that night. However, soon after eleven we observed a light mist rising from the Sarah tomb. It seemed to scintillate and sparkle as it rose, and curled in a sort of pillar or spiral. I said nothing, but I heard the rector give a sort of gasp as he clutched my arm feverishly. Great heaven, he whispered, it is taking shape. And, true enough, in a very few moments, we saw standing erect by the tomb the ghastly figure of the Countess Sarah. She looked thin and haggard still, and her face was deadly white, but the crimson lips looked like a hideous gash in the pale cheeks, and her eyes glared like red coals in the gloom of the church. It was a fearful thing to watch as she stepped unsteadily down the aisle, staggering a little as if from weakness and exhaustion. This was perhaps natural, as her body must have suffered much physically from her long incarceration, in spite of the unholy forces which kept it fresh and well. We watched her to the door and wondered what would happen, but it appeared to present no difficulty, for she melted through it and disappeared. Now, Grant, I said, do you believe? Yes, he replied, I must Everything is in your hands, and I will obey your commands to the letter, if you can only instruct me how to rid my poor people of this unnameable terror. By God's help I will, said I, but you shall be yet more convinced first, for we have a terrible work to do, and much to answer for in the future, before we leave the church again this morning. And now to work, for in its present weak state the vampire will not wander far, but may return at any time and must not find us unprepared. We stepped down from the pulpit, and taking dog roses and garlic from the vestry, proceeded to the tomb. I arrived first, and throwing off the wooden cover, cried, Look, it is empty. There was nothing there, nothing except the impress of the body in the loose, damp mold. I took the flowers and laid them in a circle round the tomb, for legend teaches us that vampires will not pass over these particular blossoms if they can avoid it. Then, eight or ten feet away, I made a circle on the stone pavement, large enough for the rector and myself to stand in, and within the circle I placed the implements that I had brought into the church with me. Now, I said, from this circle 
which nothing unholy can step across. You shall see the vampire face to face and see her afraid to cross that other circle of garlic and dog roses to regain her unholy refuge. But on no account step beyond the holy place you stand in, for the vampire has a fearful strength not her own, and like a snake can draw her victim willingly to his own destruction. Now so far my work was done, and calling the rector, we stepped into the holy circle to await the vampire's return. Nor was this long delayed. Presently, a damp, cold odor seemed to pervade the church, which made our hair bristle and flesh to creep. And then, down the aisle with noiseless feet, came that which we watched for. I heard the rector mutter a prayer, and I held him tightly by the arm, for he was shivering violently. Long before we could distinguish the features, we saw the glowing eyes and the crimson, sensual mouth. She went straight to her tomb, but stopped short when she encountered my flowers. She walked right round the tomb, seeking a place to enter, and as she walked, she saw us. A spasm of diabolical hate and fury passed over her face, but it quickly vanished, and a smile of love, more devilish still, took its place. She stretched out her arms towards us. Then we saw that round her mouth gathered a bloody froth, and from under her lips long pointed teeth gleamed and champed. She spoke, a soft, soothing voice, a voice that carried a spell with it and affected us both strangely, particularly the rector. I wished to test as far as possible, without endangering our lives, the vampire's power. Her voice got a soporific effect, which I resisted easily enough, but which seemed to throw the rector into a sort of trance. More than this, it seemed to compel him to her in spite of his efforts to resist. Come, she said, come, I give sleep and peace, sleep and peace, sleep and peace. She advanced a little towards us, but not far, for I noted the sacred circle seemed to keep her back like an iron hand. My companion seemed to become demoralized and spellbound. He tried to step forward, and finding me detain him, whispered, Harry, let me go. I must go. She is calling me. I must. I must. Oh, help me. Help me. And he began to struggle. It was time to finish. Grant, I cried in a loud, firm voice. In the name of all that you hold sacred, have done and play the man. He shuddered violently and gasped. Where am I? Then he remembered and clung to me convulsively for a moment. At this, a look of damnable hate changed the smiling face before us, and with a sort of shriek she staggered back. Back, I cried, back to your unholy tomb. No longer shall you molest the suffering world. Your end is near. It was fear now that showed itself in her beautiful face, for it was beautiful in spite of its horror, as she shrank back, back and over the circlet of flowers, shivering as she did so. At last, with a low, mournful cry, she appeared to melt back again into her tomb. As she did so, the first gleams of the rising sun lit up the world, and I knew all danger was over for the day. Taking Grant by the arm, I drew him with me out of the circle and led him to the tomb. There lay the vampire once more, stilling her living death as we had a moment before seen her in her devilish life. But in the eyes remained that awful expression of hate and cringing, appalling fear. Grant was pulling himself together. Now, I said, will you dare the last terrible act and rid the world forever of this horror? By God, he said solemnly, I will. Tell me what to do. Help me to lift her out of the tomb. She can harm us no more, I replied. With averted faces, we set to our terrible task and laid her out upon the flags. Now, I said, read the burial service over the poor body, and then let us give it its release from this living hell that holds it. Reverently, the rector read the beautiful words, and reverently I made the necessary responses. When it was over, I took the stake 
and, without giving myself time to think, plunged it with all my strength through the heart. As though really alive, the body for a moment writhed and kicked convulsively, and an awful heart-rending shriek woke the silent church. Then all was still. Then we lifted the poor body back, and thank God, the consolation that legend tells is never denied to those who have to do such awful work as ours came at last. Over the face stole a great and solemn peace. The lips lost their crimson hue. The prominent sharp teeth sank back into the mouth. And for a moment we saw before us the calm, pale face of a most beautiful woman who smiled as she slept. A few minutes more, and she faded away to dust before our eyes as we watched. We set to work and cleaned up every trace of our work and then departed for the rectory. Most thankful were we to step out of the church with its horrible associations into the rosy warmth of the summer morning. With the above and the notes in my father's diary, though a few days later this further entry occurs. July 15th. Since the 12th, everything has been quiet and as usual. We replaced and sealed up the Sarah tomb this morning. The workmen were surprised to find the body had disappeared, but took it to be the natural result of exposing it to the air. One odd thing came to my ears today. It appears that the child of one of the villagers strayed from home the night of the 11th and was found asleep in a coppice near the church, very pale and quite exhausted. There were two small marks on her throat, which have since disappeared. What does this mean? I have, however, kept it to myself, as now that the vampire is no more, no further danger either to that child or any other is to be apprehended. It is only those who die of the vampire's embrace that become vampires at death in their turn. <laughs>